how did you start as an investor? Yeah, that's a very good question. I was at university and I was going to go to law school and medical school and business school. I was a confused young man like many people when they're 21 years old. And I stumbled onto a job on Wall Street just because I liked the guy. I didn't know anything about Wall Street. But I suddenly fell in love because this was a place where they would pay me to know what was going on in the world. And my passion at the time was the world and to know everything I could about what was going on. And I couldn't believe it. They would pay me. And they'd pay me a lot of money if I did it right. And what so, did you do in that first job? Oh, the first job, I was a, 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 a research assistant. I mean, people would send, in those days, they'd send in telegrams. They'd say, does General Motors pay a dividend? And I would look it up and say, yes. You know, simple questions. But I quickly fell in love and did not go to law school or business school or medical school. I went to Wall Street. Yeah, you really <coughs> learned on the job. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that was, that's the best way, in fact. And did you invest your own money then? Well, I didn't have any money then. I was poor, still am, but I was really poor in those days. Uh, and as soon as I could save enough money, yes, I started investing. When did you start investing your own money? Well, as soon as I saved up some money. But you've got to remember, Janneke, I didn't have any money. Uh, I went to graduate school. I went to the Army. And when I came out of the Army, I had a second-hand Volkswagen and a wife. Well, I got rid of both, and I had 600 US dollars, and that's when I started investing. And what was your first investment? Oh, I don't remember. You don't remember? No. Was it I already in commodities, some of my... or do no, you think no, no, it was no. shares, 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 yeah. shares, yeah. No, gosh, I can remember some a year or two later, but I don't, rem I don't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, much less what I invested in <laughs> yeah, many decades. Yeah, that's a couple of years ago. Decades ago. Yeah, uh, but, but do you remember if you had a goal then, or did you just no, try yeah, I had a very clear goal. My goal was to, to retire by the time I was 35. I wanted to have more than one life. I, wanted to, I didn't want to wake up when I was 75, still be in the stock market. I wanted to have other careers and other lives, so I hoped that I could, I mean, this is a crazy dream, but this was my dream when I was 26, to retire by the time I was 35 and go and have other lives. And, and how did you uh, accomplish that, that? Well, I failed. I retired when I was 37. I didn't make it when I was 35. <laughs> oh, terrible. Uh, I, uh, well, we, I worked hard. I loved, I loved, I never worked. I just loved getting up in the morning and going to the office and getting involved with the market. This was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful excitement for me. Uh, so I and my partner at the time both loved what we were doing. We were very intense about it. And I did the research, he did the trading, and we were successful. Uh, do you remember what, what's the worst mistake you ever made while oh, yeah, investing? Yeah, my first wife. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm talking about investments. <laughs> <laughs> I am too. Oh, really? <laughs> I am too. You bought your wife? Uh, no, 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 no. It's just, it was a distraction or a diversion. It didn't cost me much money, but a lot of energy and emotion and time. So from that point of view, it was at a time when I needed time, energy, emotion, to, and I didn't want to be distracted from, from my life, my job. My, it wasn't my job, it was my excitement. So, no, it was expensive in, that, in terms of that because I might have been even more successful if I hadn't had that distraction. Okay, but as long as uh, investing is concerned, uh, are there any lessons that you really uh, learned in that, that starting period? Oh yeah, I learned many, uh, many things. Uh, when, you know, after I'd been in the business a couple of years, I, uh, I made a lot of money and then I thought, gosh, this is easy. And so I, I waited for the market to, I was selling short, I waited for the market to rally. I took all my money and sold short uh, and within two months I was wiped out. I lost everything. And it was because I knew what I was doing about the companies, but I, they all went bankrupt eventually. But in the meantime, they all skyrocketed. I didn't have staying power, so I lost everything. Uh, I realized how much I did not know about markets, about other people's emotions, about how other people felt in the market. So I realized there was a great deal I needed to learn. There still is, but especially in those days, that markets are not rational, and you need to factor that in. Eventually, they're rational, but there are many because times. What did you change in your tactic? Then? Well, then I started learning that I'm always early, that I see things earlier than other people. I assume everybody sees the same thing that I do. Mm -hmm. I now know they don't. So now I try to wait. If I, if I look out the window and see something, I say, I better wait. 
I better wait a year before I act, or even two years. And I still do try to wait, and I'm still always early. So I've learned that I am very bad at market timing. I've learned that I'm very bad short-term trader. Uh, and I doubt if I'll ever be good at it, but I'm trying to improve. So you're still investing for the long term? Oh yeah, I gotta pay my bills. And so that, and that's the only thing I know to do, or how to do. So but do you still need to invest? Because I gotta pay my bills. You know, I gotta pay the rent. I gotta buy the groceries somehow. So yes, how else am I gonna do it? I couldn't get a job. Nobody would hire me. Yeah, yeah. And if they could hire me, I, I couldn't keep a job. There are people that stop with everything when they're 71. Yeah, but what, what, what am I going to do with it? How am I going to pay the bills? Uh, turn the money over to you to manage for me? No, I have to do something to, yeah. to have income, to pay the rent. Is it also something that you still enjoy investing in Oh, yeah, yourself? it's always great fun. I mean, unfortunately, Janneke, because of who I am, if I, look, if I look out the window and see something interesting, yeah. I don't just wave. I mean, I say, hey, wait a minute. That's something exciting and interesting, and I should do something about it. And so I pursue it and figure out what to do next. And then, I mean, I don't guess I could not do it. I, I, it's just because when I look at the world and I see things changing, I try to do something about it. You're on a very busy schedule. You're, you're uh, speaking everywhere, also here at uh, Skagen. Uh, what does a typical day in your life look like? Well, if I'm in Singapore, I get up in the morning at 6 because my children get up at 6 to go to school. I take them to school on a bicycle, which I bought in Amsterdam, by the way. And then I come back and get the other daughter, and she goes to school an hour later. We have breakfast together, the younger one. And then I come back and I exercise for two or three hours. Then I get on the bicycle again and go pick up the first one, come back, have lunch with her, then go get the, the second one on a bicycle, and then in the afternoon, I start thinking about investing or meetings or, or other things. And, and do you trade every day? No, no, no. I, I rarely trade. Brokers don't like me, Janneke, because I'm, <laughs> I'm so inactive. You know, I might buy something and the broker, ten years later, saying, are you ever going to sell? You know, I want more commissions. No, no, I'm not a very good customer because I trade very, very rarely. Yeah, how, how often? Uh well, I don't know. I never thought about it. Maybe once a month, once a quarter. I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, and not that. If you're a short-term trader, yeah, there are lots of ideas. But I'm not. So there are not a lot of ideas to, that are good ideas that people can find. Yeah. Uh, most good investors don't do anything. Most of that, they just wait. They wait for their investments to mature, or they wait till they can find something new. You know, I like to wait until if I look over in the corner and there's some money over there, I like to do something. Yeah, because how do you decide wh where you're going to invest in? Do you read a lot? Do you go to I do countries? Read a lot. Uh, I read a lot. I do travel a lot. Uh, yeah. I'm not looking for investments, but doing other things. Uh, and I see something, then I act. Uh, I read a lot. I certainly read a lot. I, I don't yeah, you have get your ideas in day-to-day -day life? Yeah. You just see something on the street? Oh, really? Or? Yes. Well, yeah, getting off an airplane or walking into a country or from reading, from the in, internet. Is, there's all kind of information these days on the internet. I don't have a television, I'm, I'm sorry to say. I don't talk to stockbrokers. It's just from life and reading. It's where I find my ideas. And are you invested in uh, shares right now? I have shares in some countries, yes. Yeah, not just in commodities. Oh, no, 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 I've never been, I don't think I've ever been all in one, one asset class. I've, I always have more than one thing. Yeah, because uh, how do you value shares uh, compared to commodities and compared to credit, for example? Well, it depends on, on the circumstances at the time. Uh, it's sometimes commodities are much cheaper uh, than other things, or even like now, some commodities are very cheap. Not all commodities are very cheap now, and some shares are very cheap. Not, the New York Stock Exchange is making all-time highs. It's not yeah. cheap. But if you look at some place like Russia or even Tokyo or China, there's some things that are very cheap. The Japanese stock market is down 70% from its all-time high. So it's probably cheaper in Tokyo than it is in New York. That's a place to start. And then if I find something in Tokyo, then I might buy it. Yeah. So you can say it's overall, shares are overall expensive or... 
Certainly in New York, certainly in Germany. Yeah. Well, they're certainly expensive, yes. I don't think they're, well, some are in a bubble, but no. I'd rather look at Russia or China or Japan or places that are still depressed rather yeah. than places that are booming. Yeah, and what about credits? Well, <laughs> You think if there's interesting? a bubble with long-term government bonds, they're probably in a bubble or near a bubble. Doesn't mean it can't get worse, but the United States long-term government bond made it slow in 1981 and went up for 31 years. It's not cheap, you know. Yes. Long-term interest rates in the world are near historic lows, so they're certainly not cheap. Doesn't mean they can't go up more, or that the bonds can't go up more. But they're certainly not cheap, and you should. I anyway am thinking about selling them short. I've sold them short in the past. I'm not at the moment. Um, if you own bonds, you should think about selling them, unless they're very short-term bonds or special situations, because what is going on in the bond market historically is not. It's not low. What are you buying at the moment? Well, at the moment, what am I buying? I bought some Japanese shares recently. I bought SAS in Scandinavia recently. I bought, uh, that's all I can think of that I bought recently. Yeah. Uh, I bought, well, I bought some yen. I bought some, a, a Japanese share. Recently, I've been, I've been hedging the currency in Japan when I buy shares. This time, last week, I bought a Japanese company and I didn't hedge the currency because there's so many people short the yen right now. And normally, when you have everybody on one side of the boat, you should go to the other side of the boat at least for a while. Uh, to get your ideas, do you also sometimes get in touch with other well-known investors? No, I no? have found no, no, no. I have found that when I get ideas from other people, I nearly always make a mistake. So I have learned. I try to discipline myself that if I hear something from you or anybody, that. I try to ignore it and not act on it because most of the time when I follow someone else's suggestions, I have lost money. Are you sometimes in touch with, uh, for example, your old partner, George Soros? No, or? no, that's been decades. You yeah. might as well ask me about my first wife. <laughs> you already did ask me about my first wife. No, you started talking about it. <laughs> well, you asked me about mistakes. If you would uh, start all over again and you had some money, and you have to build it all up again and you start investing now, what would you do? <laughs> well, that's an extremely good question if I had to start over. Well, first of all, I would, I would try to know that I'm usually early. I would not have made that mistake that I made a couple of years into my career where I lost everything because I didn't know about markets. So now I would try to get my timing better. Uh, but other than that, I don't think I would do much different in the markets. I, I always invested around the world. I always invested in all asset classes. I always invested in uh, long and short. I guess one thing I would do different if I were starting over, I would learn Chinese. I mean, if I was smart, yeah. I would have learned Chinese back in the old days. When I was a, a student, I went to Oxford because after my American year, because I thought, well, Oxford, that's, whew, that's great. But I should have gone to China. If I had been smart, see, when I was a young man, I was looking backward. Mm -hmm. Looking backward meant Oxford. If I had been smart and were looking forward, I would have learned Chinese. Because your daughters, they must speak Chinese My daughters Chinese now, now speak perfect Mandarin. Yes, yes, my daughters speak perfect Chinese, because uh, I hope that I'm getting it right this time and looking to the future. And even if China's not the next great country in the world, there's still a billion and a half people who use Mandarin every day. Even if China has problems, I'm not going to stop teaching them Mandarin and teach them Dutch or something, or Danish. I'm going to continue to teach them Mandarin. Well, it's been said that uh, we are entering a new era full of different values. Uh, do you think that's true? And do you think that... Uh, because of that, market principles have changed. Market principles have not changed at all. We are in a, the, the world is always changing. You can look back at any time in history, Janneke, pick a year, and then look at the world 15 years later, it's entirely different from what people, look at 1960. No matter what people thought in 1960, 15 years later, oh my gosh, look at 1990. 
No matter what people thought in 1990, 15 years later, the world was dramatically different. That has happened throughout history. So the world is always changing. Are the principles the same? The principles are still the same. You buy low, you sell high, you uh, do not jump in with a crowd, you do not follow manias and bubbles. You, those principles are the same. The world still needs good judgment and rewards good judgment and the people who do their homework. That will never change. Financial experts are uh, forecasting a down year for precious metals. Uh, gold has been high on uh, 1900 in 2011 and since then actually declined a lot. Uh, it's now about $1200, uh, silver about 20, a little bit below. They've both declined a lot. Do you think that uh, the prices will go up again? Well, I own both. I'm not buying now uh, because I, I, I am looking for another time, a, l a better time, or another time to buy gold and silver sometime in the future. It may not happen. If it doesn't, it's okay. I, o I own both at the moment, but I am waiting for another time to buy both. And what signals are you looking for then? Despair. Uh, you know, right now there's still a lot of gold bugs who think that gold is holy. It cannot go down that they'll never sell their gold. When they give up, when they give up and there's despair in the market and they say, I never want to own gold again, I hope I'm smart enough but to buy. But are you looking for that despair in, in newspapers and magazines and or websites? Well, it'll be or everywhere. How do you it'll be, it'll be, I'll get emails. It'll be on the internet. It'll be in the television. It'll be on the, uh, the prices will be collapsing. It'll be in the newspapers. It'll be everywhere. When there's despair in a market, one usually finds it picks it up somewhere because there's so yeah. much despair. Everybody hates it. But when is that going to happen? Uh, I wish I were that smart. <laughs> you should watch Netherlands one and you could find out. I don't know. Maybe this year, more likely next year, more likely this year or next year. So what's the price of gold go going to do this year, you think? Because you really think I'm that smart? Yeah. I have no idea. Watch Netherlands 1. You can learn <laughs> the answer to all of these questions. Uh, well, gold has not gone down 50% uh, in this correction at all. And 50% corrections are normal in markets. Things are always correcting by 50%. So I don't know if it's going to happen, but 950% correction would be 960 US dollars. So if it goes between 900 and 1,000, I'm sure I would be buying uh, gold again and silver at the same time. Uh, but I, I have no idea. I have to judge these things day by day to see what's going on in the world. I mean, if Spain and Italy suddenly go bankrupt, everything is going to collapse. Uh, it just depends on what's happening in the world. If America goes to war with Iran, everything is going to go through the roof. So I would be buying things higher. Uh, it just depends yeah. on what's happening in the world. Yeah. Uh, as a lot of financial analysts say that, that uh, gold will go down more this year, uh, there was also last year a Citigroup strategist and he said that uh, gold was going to rise above $3,500 and silver even about hundred dollars. What should we, how should we interpret uh, Well, I don't know, you should like ask that. him. I, gold will certainly go above 3,500 someday, but not this day, no. not, not this year, unless, no. unless something strange happens. Uh, right now, there are many people skeptical of gold. You just said all analysts say it's gonna go down, which means it's probably going to rally for a while. As I said, yeah. when everybody's on one side of the boat, you should go to the other side of the boat. And there are many, many bears, short-term bears anyway, on metals right now, which means we're probably going to have a rally. But I'm not buying, not at the moment. You're not buying because you're waiting? I'm waiting for, for what, whatever's going to happen to give me a great opportunity to buy gold, to make it go to 900, if, whatever. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe it'll be 1,100. But if it's war, maybe it'll be 1,400, you know, when the opportunity comes. Uh, you're not going to buy gold, or not now, but there are a lot of people that have money on their savings accounts with very low interest rates. What should they do with their money? Well, they shouldn't do anything. Uh, I know low interest rates are terrible. You know, it's horrible what governments are doing to us right now. At the moment, governments all over the world are punishing the people who save and invest. You know, now they're getting nothing for doing yeah. the right thing. 
governments are rewarding the people who did the wrong thing, the people who went out and borrowed a lot of money, made terrible mistakes. So governments are bailing them out by having very low interest rates. But the people who are having to pay the price are the people who did what we think is right. You save your money, you don't go deep into debt, you know, you, you save for the future. Well, all of those people are getting destroyed now by governments at the expense to save the people who, who made terrible, terrible mistakes. But at the moment, you should suffer with it and wait until you find something that you think is a good investment. Don't go making investments just because you can get higher yields unless you know a lot, unless you yourself know a lot about it, because otherwise yeah. it's going to get worse. Are agricultural commodities uh, something that belongs in uh, an investor's portfolio? In my view, yes. I mean, first of all, we all know what sugar is. We all know what cotton is. We all know what wheat is. At least that doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean you'll make money, but at least it's a lot easier than investing in something you don't know what it is. Many people invested in dot-com. I didn't know what dot-com was but they invested yeah. and lost a lot of money. At least they, everybody watching this knows what sugar is. So you, you know where to start. Then you have to figure out, is there going to be too much sugar or too little sugar? But in my view, yes. Agriculture is an extremely important industry in the world. It's important to everybody in the world. We all eat, we all wear clothes. You know, plenty of opportunities. So yes, in my view, everybody should know some, at least learn about and find opportunities. Are there uh, commodities that uh, nobody ever looks at but are still very interesting? Well, there are things like uh, uh, the base metals right now. Nobody's looking at them because they've been beaten down so much. There are probably good opportunities in things like lead and zinc and tin, nickel, if one looks at them. Uh, there's something called uh, graphene. I don't know if you know what graphene is. Nobody did 10 years Not really, ago. No. Well, it's, it's a new miracle. A guy won the Nobel Prize for it uh, f three or four years ago because he discovered oh. graphene, which comes from graph. Graphene is a miracle. I mean, it's an absolute miracle. You what can you use it for? Everything. It's astonishing. It's lighter than paper and stronger than steel. It's absolutely amazing. You can make clothes. You can make airplanes. Yeah, I mean, if you read about graphene, you think you're reading a, a science fiction story, but it's real. I mean, the guy won the Nobel Prize because he figured out how to, how to make graphene. Well, they're now starting to develop it in their products. So this, I mean, there's no market and you can't buy futures in graphene, but there are graphene companies now that one can look at. Uh, something else is phosphorus. The world is running out of phosphorus. Phosphorus is needed for agri phosphorus is needed for lots of stuff, but phosphorus is running out worldwide. There's no futures market in phosphorus, but these are some things where there are going to be spectacular fortunes made in the next decade or two. And it's perfect. You don't know what graphene is. That's wonderful. Most people don't. I didn't. Six months ago, I'd never heard of graphene, much less the Nobel Prize for discovering this stuff. Now I do. Years ago, you moved to Singapore because you wanted your daughters to learn Chinese. Uh, how are your daughters doing learning Chinese? Oh, they're fabulous. They speak like natives. I mean, my older daughter, she's 10, recently won the nationwide Mandarin speaking contest. Now, if you saw a movie where a blue-eyed girl was the best Mandarin speaker in a Chinese country, you would say, what? What a terrible movie. But it's true. Well, this 10 year old girl with blue eyes and blonde hair is the best Mandarin speaker, speaker in a Chinese country. Both of my little girls speak perfect Mandarin. It's amazing. Yeah, congratulations. Do you th uh, still think that uh, China is becoming uh, a big power in the world? I know uh, that China will be the most important country in the 21st century, whether we like it or not. And so I moved to Asia because of that, and my children now speak Mandarin. But I mean, maybe there'll be setbacks, maybe I'm wrong, but there are a billion and a half people who speak Mandarin every day, or Chinese every day, so yeah. it won't be a terrible mistake. And you don't have any moving plans yet? No, 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 no. no. Because no. a lot of uh, economic commentators talk about uh, the growth in China that's uh, going down a little bit, still 7%. Janneke, Janneke, in America, in the 19th century, as we were rising, we had 15 depressions with a D. We had a horrible civil war. We had massacres in the streets. We had very few human rights. We had very little rule of law. And yet, 
we did a pretty good job in the 20th century. China had lots of problems, many problems, but I'm not going to stop teaching them Mandarin and move to Amsterdam and teach them Dutch. I mean, I love the Netherlands, I love Amsterdam, but Chinese is a better language. What about uh, the rest of the emerging markets? Because they haven't, emerging markets haven't been performing uh, very well lately. Uh, what, what's your view on emerging markets? Well, first of all, you, there's no such, um, yes, there is such a thing as emerging markets, but you can't just buy emerging markets. There are hundred dozens of scores of emerging countries. There's no question. Turkey, I'm not so optimistic about. Indonesia, on the other hand, I'm very optimistic about Myanmar. I'm wildly excited about North Korea. For instance, yeah. there are many countries that are emerging with their great opportunities. But some, you have to be careful. It's like stocks. You can't just buy all stocks. You have to be careful. Uh, later this afternoon, you're going to talk uh, at the conference for Skagen. What is going to be the main message? Well, the main message is going to be that the world is facing some very serious problems in the next few years. But if you want to invest, these are some places where you might consider investing. Uh, but you must be careful because there's a lot of optimism in the markets around the world, a lot of high prices in the world, and it's all based on artificial ocean of liquidity. This is the first time in recorded history that all major central banks are printing huge amounts of money. So there's a huge ocean of liquidity. Look, look out the window. You can see the water, the liquidity rising. Um, it's dangerous. Uh, at the moment, it's a lot of fun. And as long as it lasts, a lot of people are going to make money. But be very careful, because when it starts drying up, we're all going to have a disaster. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure.